What's going on, everybody? Zach Rosenblatt here with Mike K. We're in New Jersey right now recording the latest episode of the No Huddle Show. This is NJ.com, so we stick it in New, stay in New Jersey. Or he's represent. <laughs> or he's represent. Um, a lot to talk about. Mike, have, Mike and I have a lot of other stuff on our mind, but we're going to focus on football. You know, the Game of Thrones episode battle of Winterfell was, was on Sunday, and we saw Avengers together, Avengers Endgame in the middle of the draft, which was a bold strategy by us because we were pretty distracted on Friday. Uh, a lot of emotions, but we're going to stick to the draft. A lot to talk about. Eagles made five picks, uh, which is the same amount they made last year. It's not many, which it, it's interesting that they did that because Jeffrey Lurie had just talked about at the owners' meetings about how they're going to add like 20 new rookies over the next two years, and that, that would imply that they're going to add 15 more next year, but mm-hmm. <laughs> they do have a lot of picks next year, but I mean, what, what did you, what'd you make of that, that they wound up, you know, it seems like they're turning, they, they focused on guys they really like, they traded up in the first round, uh, maybe they're focused a little more on next year's draft and just winning right now with the guys they have, like that's kind of how it feels. Well, I think the way they, they completed, not completed, but molded the roster during free agency and what they did last year allowed them to do that. allowed them to kind of do that they came into the draft with 75 players so from there you're thinking well they can really only add 15 including free agency um it's gonna be tough to make this roster as a rookie so put all of our assets into four or five guys that we think that we really like yeah them. we can build for the long term um I thought they managed the draft really well. It seemed like they played the board to their strengths. The fact that they waited in the second round and probably got a guy that they wanted to trade up for but didn't need to, and Miles Sanders was a huge deal for them. I think JJ, after watching um, JJ, our Seagull Whiteside's tape, I totally get why they uh, went after him. Um and they were able to take him at 57. They didn't press and try to get a third-round pick like you and I assumed they would. But they still got value because I, I, I think day two and day one were so important to them and the future of this franchise. You, you needed a future starting wide receiver. You needed a future starting running back. And you needed a left tackle of the future. They got all three of those. Um, I know some people were disappointed by the lack of defensive picks. Um, and that's something we'll get into later. But overall, I thought they played the board really well. I, it's hard to knock. I give them a B overall um, because I thought day three. Well, uh, I, I didn't like their day three as as much either. Yeah, I, I didn't think they – Value-wise, I didn't really like what they did. What I think happened was they put so much focus on being patient and smart in day one and day two that they went for guys that they like with upside in day three, which is typically what you do. Yeah. But – I feel like they could have probably traded back uh, out of the fourth round and got another seventh round pick to, and then drafted Sharif Miller. I think Sharif Miller would have been there mid-fifth round. He felt like an overdraft a little bit, yeah. Uh, Clayton Thorson, I think he was going to get drafted around there, but, you know, he's a quarterback, so they're always going to win out. Um, absolutely love their thought process with trading uh, the seventh round pick for Hassan Ridgeway with the Colts because you're looking at one of the bottom seventh round picks who's probably not going to make the team anyway. You're trading for a guy who has experience, who's played in over 30 games, who has a connection to the front office. I think that's a really smart move. I think it gives the Eagles options if they want to keep five defensive tackles. I saw in your 53-man mock that, that you had him making the team. I think there's a very good chance that he does. Uh, I really liked him in 2016 coming out of Texas. He's going to play three technique. He can play some one. Um, but it's smart. They, they utilize their sele- – I'm rambling, but they utilize their selections very well. Um, Clayton Thorson, I've got a lot to say about him, like a lot. But overall, I thought they did really well. They Like Sharif Miller to me, before we get into the tape and overall – they went with a guy that they felt comfortable with. When you're in the fifth round... Or Philly they, guy. Yeah, when you're in the fifth round and there's uh, defensive end talent, just from a scouting perspective, there's not a lot of separation between an undrafted guy and a, and a fifth round pick, realistically. Um, look, Matt Burke was at Penn State, the defensive assistant. He's a former defensive coordinator. He knows what he's looking for. Uh, you know, the kids from Philly, like you said... They've clearly watched him a lot. Um, 
and they liked him. And he's got a lot of upside. He's a guy that can really, he and Josh Sweat, if the two of them can reach even half their potential, you've got a really good defensive end rotation behind Derek Barnett and Brandon Graham. Yeah, I mean, with, with that, you're like, you're giving yourself a lot of chances, which mm-hmm. is what Howie, that's like part of the formula. You So you, you bring in two guys with the physical and athletic traits, and if, you hope one of them works out. If they both do, that's best case scenario. Right. And and I think jo- a lot of people underestimated Josh Sweat. He was playing in a new defensive scheme to what he was accustomed to. He was really misused at FSU as a basically a five technique rusher, which doesn't fit his game at all. He's a lengthy guy. He should be playing in the wide nine. He really enjoyed playing in the wide nine. He didn't really get a lot of snaps. Um, and obviously he's got that injury history, but I think having a full off season and being able to recover and, and do all that stuff will pay dividends for him this year. All right. So we'll, let's go through each pick. We did talk a bit about Andre Dillard, like immediately after the draft, we've had some time to process it, but we're going to go through each pick. Uh, I'll give you the big picture. You give us what you saw on film and then we'll kind of break down the draft from there. Cool. All right. Well, first Andre Dillard, the Eagles traded up from 25 to 22 to get him. I think the trades a part of the equation. They gave up. Uh, one of their fourth round picks and their sixth round pick to move up three spots to get their left tackle of the future. You and I both raved about it on Thursday, and I, I still kind of feel the same way. Uh, Harry Roseman, Joe Douglas, both viewed him as a top 10 pick, the number one tackle in the class. They wouldn't have traded up if they didn't believe that. I think Peter King wrote something in his Monday morning column that they, I mean, this, we all could have guessed this, but that the Texans had their eye on him. Eagles knew that. I mean, you could, they probably could have guessed that without talking around the league. They needed offensive linemen. So they traded right ahead of the Texans. The Texans wound up getting Titus Howard right after. So the fact that they got a tackle means that they probably would have got Dillard if he was still there. I mean, he would have been still there. So in terms of just like value, going and, get, going and getting your guy, position he plays, need, like it, it, it was pretty much – you know, especially considering we didn't have him as someone who was going to be there that late, that that was as well as that pick could have gone. Like they get an A for me on that still. Yeah. Um, so watching him, I watched him versus Washington and Oregon uh, yesterday, and you know, I'm no offensive line expert, um, and you don't know what the protection calls are, but from what I got, really good punch. He's got really good length. Um, Juan Castillo would have loved him. He's a very very talented retreat blocker. Um, there were times where he kind of gave up pressure because he couldn't get his hands on guys. His technique's very good. He dances pretty well. Um, he's a guy that never stops blocking. And I think that that's, you know, he's got a good base for what Jeff Statlin wants to do. Very smart. He pass off blocks very, very well, especially against the blitz. Uh, he's always kind of aware of what's going on on film. And, You know, a lot's being made of his run blocking because they didn't really do it that much. Against Washington, I saw him make at least two or three very good run blocks. He gets to the second level relatively well. And, um, you know, I, I I think he's a really good pick. Yeah, and his the athleticism... Like that, that that should have tipped you off that he's a guy that the Eagles really liked. If you just look at his numbers, like he fits the mold of the kind of guys they look for. And I'm, did you see his athleticism on film? I'm sure too. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, he's a guy that gets the next level very, very well. Yes. All right. So second round, they got their running back finally in the second round. They got Miles Sanders at number 53 overall. Um, he's a guy that backed up Saquon Barkley for two years, didn't really play, got his chance in year three. He had a really good season in Penn State. He didn't really get past the ball that much, though he did like he was occasionally splitting out into the slot. Like he's a capable receiver. It, he clearly the guy they really like. You know what? The first question I I asked them was about you know what, what they liked about Miles Sanders and why they wanted to get him so badly. And all and and Cowie Roseman said everybody in the front office was was in love with the kid. Um, he's a guy that. You know, he's not going to be the number one running back right away. I wouldn't be surprised by the end of the year maybe he was if after he gets some time to develop. But it'll, him and Jordan Howard will be the one, two, and then you have Corey Clement there at the three. You feel pretty good about their running back rotation right now. Yeah, for sure. And some insight on that. They met with him at the Combine before his pro, then before his pro day. Then they sent Mike Groh to his pro day and one of their heads of scouting. And, and then they met with him. Um, so, like... They love this kid, and I had been saying this. I mean, if you, you're a regular listener of the podcast, you know I've been saying they love this guy, and he seemed to be their top target on day two. Um, and there's a, a lot of reasons why. There is a little bit of LaShawn McCoy to him. He's very good moving laterally. Uh, a lot of people have made 
comments about his blocking ability. He's a willing blocker. It's more technique. Like, he does a lot of shoulder stuff where it makes it look like he's kind of disinterested in the block. Um, but he's willing to. I think they just need to teach him technique, and I think that's something Deuce probably thinks that he can he can help him with pretty easily. Really strong runner out of shotgun. He's going to make the first guy miss most of the time. He's got... I think his biggest strength is his vision. He sees what's going on in front of him. He, I saw Lance Zerline of NFL.com compare him to to TJ Eldon, which is the most bonkers comparison I've ever seen. Because, one, TJ Eldon's a really good blocker and a really good receiver, but he has absolutely no vision in between the tackles. And that's... So other than that, they're the same. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... It, it, other it, than all the things you just said. TJ like, Eldon's also, like, three inches taller, too. But, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and he runs up right... Anyway, whatever. Anywho. So So I watched Miles versus Kentucky, Michigan, Pittsburgh, and Illinois. This is my longest tape study. <clears throat> and I just love the way he churns his legs in the pile. He's... They could have targeted him so much more in the passing game. I mean, McSorley, for all of his strengths and weaknesses, does not look at the running back very often. A um, little inconsistent as a catcher, uh, but when he catches it in stride, he can he can ball. He had some wide receiver-esque over-the-shoulder type catches during his time there. Uh, he can cut on a dime. He has a lot of wiggle. He takes really good angles to, to holes. He attacks holes. He is not a passive runner at all. And I think that's what should really stick out to Eagles fans. Again, I think the blocking stuff is more technique driven than it, general interest or being bad at it. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that. He worked on his hands a lot as a receiver this off season, watched a lot of Alvin Kamara and Tariq Cohen. Um, and I think this is a home run. Like, I really do. I gave it a B plus only because the running back position is devalued and he's going to be part of a committee and they traded for Jordan Howard. He could be a three down guy tomorrow. Uh, they, luckily, they don't need him to be. And I think he gets 10 to 12 touches per game. Um, he's going to split snap. He's not going to be the third down guy. I think Clement's definitely going to yeah, be the third down guy. And that was his role that Super Bowl year and it kind of makes sense. I think you'll see Jordan Howard and, and, and Miles, Miles. Sanders uh, kind of alternate between series kind of like what they did with the Garrett Blunt and JHI a couple of years ago. Um, there's a lot of Jordan Howard's a better receiver than he's given credit for. Yeah. So I think and he's a good pass blocker too. So that's why I think they're going to follow the hot hand, but it will be a one, two punch. And I think you'll have Corey Clement be that third down gadget guy. Who, who do you think this is a little unreal. Who do you think is the fourth running back? Do you think it's Adams or Smallwood? I think it's Shasha. I think I think they. That's, that was my prediction. I had some people push back on that, but so Miles Sanders to give you a better like kind of clear cut thing. Um, there's stuff that Wendell Smallwood does a little bit better than him, but Miles Sanders is basically a rich man's Wendell Smallwood. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking that. Uh, the only reason Smallwood stuck around this long is because coaches just trust him. Well, I think Wendell... So, can we talk about this for just two seconds? Yeah, yeah. Wendell played very well last year. I think people... Relative to our expectations. Right, relative to expectations. I mean, they viewed him as, like, the fourth running back. Uh, And he he helped them on that playoff run. Mm -hmm. Um, I think he's a number two somewhere else. I would not be shocked if he was... If there's, like, an injury, like like a Dalvin Cook-like injury, and somebody traded for him. I mean... um, this running back class was not very good, and there were guys that fell. And I mean, Sanders was the second running back picked, and that was number fifty-three. Right, yeah. exactly. So, um, again, I, I think Wendell Smallwood's going to get a home. I think he's the most tradable player on this roster right now. Um, I think Josh Adams. Look, that shoulder surgery or that shoulder injury clearly slowed him down towards the end of the season. I know a lot of people thought it was just because he was bad, but he. I think I, I couldn't believe that how quickly people turned on him. That was so weird to me. Yeah, I mean he's a local kid. I know he shouldn't have been their number one running back, but that's not his fault. Like. Yeah, I, I know for a fact that Deuce Daly is a huge fan of his, so I would imagine that he would be the fourth guy. Yeah. All right. So the next pick I actually found to be their most interesting draft pick of their entire haul: JJ Arcega Whiteside, receiver from Stanford. So they they met with like a lot of receivers in the pre-draft process. We didn't hear anything about the meeting with him. Almost every one of the receivers they met was, fell into the slot receiver mold. So we kind of both went under the assumption they wanted to get some of it. Maybe if A.J. Brown was there, they would have got him. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, f- I found it interesting because J.J. Arcega Whiteside is decidedly not a slot receiver. He's an outside guy. He's in the Alshon Jeffrey mold, uh, which I think is an important distinction because 
Alshon Jeffrey, I'm not sure what his future is after the next year or two. He is getting up there. His contract is large. He is injury prone. Uh, he's an important part of this team, but like I, I see, I can, I see Arcega Whiteside as like being developed as his eventual replacement. And and there, there was some pushback on them picking a guy like Arcega Whiteside because he wasn't as big a, of a receiver name as some of these other guys, and there wasn't a lot of hype around him. But the biggest appeal, I mean, you watched that film, but to me, like just looking on paper and reading about him, the, he's just another red zone weapon. They have a maybe the best group, collection of red zone options in the NFL. They have him who's six foot two, six foot three, and like two hundred twenty pounds. They have Alshon Jeffrey who's six foot three and two hundred twenty pounds. They have Zach Ertz who's six five, six six, and two hundred fifty pounds. And they have Dallas Goddard who's six six and two hundred sixty pounds. Plus Jordan Howard who's one of the better short yardage running backs in the NFL. Like Hart, I don't know if there's a better group surrounding a quarterback coming out of this offseason than the one that Carson Wentz has maybe in Cleveland and maybe there's like a couple others but it, it was it's just really smart move because he's a guy who can help them right now without being their number three receiver he can help them from the number four spot yeah I think he's going to end up being the X receiver eventually which is what Alshon is and um you know He's a guy that has reliable hands. Um, he's a very smart football player. Like you can see it kind of in his routes. He's very stiff uh, when he. It's very. He's a very weird case study because he's a guy that you know we reported over the weekend that he had said that you know getting off of press coverage is like doing a crossover in basketball. He's got a extensive basketball background. He really does have some fast feet. He looks, you know, like he you know. He, he looks like a point guard when he's trying to get off the line. Um, and I think fans will really like that. If you don't get your hands on him, he can get by you. He's got very quick feet. The problem with him is he's very stiff as a route runner. Like, he rounds out his routes. He's not particularly fast. I mean, he ran in the 4-4s, four but he's he looks like a lumbering runner. Um, if he beats you one-on-one, -on -one, chances are you're, he's going to draw a P.I. or he's going to beat you for a decent gain. Um, when he's covered pretty handedly, he's going to win 50-50 matchups 90% of the time or get a P.I. Um, he demands that other corner, the corner be physical with him because if you're not, you're going to lose that matchup. I, I was sitting there thinking, I imagine J.J. is what Chip Kelly thought he saw when he watched Riley Cooper. Because they're very comparable players from a yeah. from a build and a game standpoint, um, but JJ's got a skill set that's really interesting. I mean, his, his release off the line of scrimmage is fantastic. He's a very willing blocker. Teams are going to love the way he attacks the ball in the air. Um, he had a fantastic touchdown against Oregon. Um, he really showed off his reach. I mean, he just like skied for the ball. Uh, He's a guy that I think needs some development as far as where he puts his hands and his catching radius, but he has a big catching radius. I think this guy is somebody who's going to be a possession receiver for them for the next 10 years. I, I really do. Like, I, I think if you're an Eagles fan, you should be pretty excited about this guy. Yeah, so one of our main thoughts coming into the draft was if they got a receiver in the second round, it was going to impact Nelson Aguilar. It, it, I don't think this impacts Nelson Aguilar, number one. Number two, I think Nelson, Mac Holland should be a little bit nervous about his future in this franchise. Yeah, yeah, they, sure. They've repeatedly, especially last year, they just kept on bringing on guys like low-level veterans when it was supposed to be Mac Holland's chance. He wound up not even playing a single snap last year. They drafted another guy. They brought in Deshaun Jackson. They brought back Nelson Aguilar and Alshon Jeffrey. And, you know, they signed a guy like Charles Johnson. They still have, like, Shelton Gibson lingering. Like, I, I think Mac Hollins makes the team, but I don't think his future Excuse is me. very secure. Like, uh, he should be worried about next year. How do you think Sheldon Gibson feels? Yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> yeah uh, he's, I, he's good on special teams will be the reason why he sticks around, if anything. But I don't see him being an offensive factor. Yeah. Um, from Nelson Aguilar's standpoint, they really don't have a lot of guys that can play the slot. Yeah, that's the thing. I'm wondering if you put Alshon Jeffrey in there if Al if, if Nelson gets injured because they did some like good stuff with him. Uh, or if Dallas Goddard. If you remember Zach Ertz, yeah. if you remember, they did a lot of like slot screens with Alshon Jeffrey in the red zone, and they worked really, really well because he was a big body, and you can't just immediately take him down. I'm wondering if that's something they do with JJ a little bit too. I think JJ can play in the slot, but I wouldn't yeah, put yeah. him there normally. Um, 
Yeah, Matt Collins, whatever. Uh, sorry, <laughs> like, I mean, I don't... Scouting report, whatever. I, I, well, I think... I know, I'm kidding. You know, something the fans and writers get really excited... I mean, we do it about every different player. Not about Matt Collins, obviously, but... People get blown away by, like, if a guy has, like, some raw skills, and I think he's a good special teams player. I mean, that's what he is. Yeah. I don't think they view him as, like, a foundational piece of wide receiver. I don't think he's ever going to be a starter in the league. He can be a contributor. He'll be the fifth wide receiver. They'll probably keep six, if I had to guess, um, because they need a returner. Um, and we'll see where that comes from. Yeah. Right. I roll. Uh, but I think Miles Sanders apparently said on... Uh... One of the radio shows that they were looking at him as a returner. He has experience yeah, as a so, kick returner. So maybe I'm, he's kick and Deshaun is punt. I'm not sure. I don't put either one of those guys back there. I mean, Deshaun maybe in like special circumstances, but yeah, maybe. I don't know. Corey Clement could be the kick returner yeah. again, in theory. Um, yeah, so JJ, I watched against uh, Washington State, Oregon, and Notre Dame, and he's just extremely consistent. And I think that's something that the Eagles probably liked. I also think some something that fans and, and media kind of overlook with Carson Wentz. Yeah, he can he can throw rockets all the time, but he really likes to loft up passes. And frankly, him not having to drive the football a ton will probably help with his back long term. You know, lofting passes is a good thing. And you saw the success that Nick Foles had with Alshon Jeffrey. He can go up and get it. JJ can go up and get it. Zach Ertz, Dallas Goddard, what have you. Um, Lofting throws to Deshaun Jackson down the field. I think the only guy he really needs to throw bullets to is is Nelson Aguilar, and Nelson's great at that. So, catching bullets. Um, (laughs) Well, he has on Twitter. Uh, But, yeah, I think this wide receiver tight end group is very, very, very intriguing. And I I think this – I've said this before. This offseason is about making Carson feel comfortable – Getting Dillard as the swing tackle is an upgrade. Awesome. He uh, Andre Dillard's a really good pass, like really, 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 really developed pass blocker. Uh, and JJ Arcega Whiteside can catch the football from anywhere. So, yeah, I think uh, he needs to stay on his feet. He does do catch a lot of diving passes for no reason. He's very dramatic. <laughs> so he and I have a lot in common. But yes. That's my take on that. You didn't intern for Condoleezza Rice, though. All right. What? <laughs> you didn't intern for Condoleezza Rice. Nope, I just misspelled her name on Twitter. <laughs> All right, so fourth round, they so they traded their first fourth round pick mm-hmm. in that Andre Dillard deal, which was fine. Um, then they picked Sharif Miller mm-hmm. at the very last pick of the fourth round. Mm-hmm. I, In terms of value, I didn't like this pick very much. There were some guys, I mean... Maybe they didn't evaluate those other guys that well, but there were some other guys on the board that I liked more than him. He seemed like more of a fifth, sixth, seventh round guy. Um, but if they view it, they like his traits, they like his potential, they can afford to develop him. If Chris Long is retiring, I'm a little concerned about their depth at defensive end in terms of proving guys. I don't know if he's ready to play as a rookie. You, you watch this film. I mean, what, what do you think? Um... So he's not very developed. Yeah, that's that was my issue. Which is good and bad. Um, for one, the raw talent's there. He's got great burst off the edge. He's very good at setting the edge. Uh, he's got a good motor. Uh, Andy Reid style thing. He can he he doesn't have developed moves yet. Like he tried to spin move, and in the NFL he would have been thrown to the ground. Um, he tries to win with speed. He tries to win with burst. He, he'll bull rush a little bit, but it's not really impressive, and it's not very technique driven. Um, he uses his strength a lot. He's a very strong guy, uh, but sometimes he tends to like rush up right, and that's going to hurt him in the NFL. Josh Sweat's kind of a similar prospect. In that regard, um, he can beat a tight end one-on-one, which is important because he's going to face tight ends quite a bit because he'll probably rush from the the strong side, I'd assume. Um, Yeah, they just need to develop his hands, and I think they just need to develop him as, like, a rusher. Like, he's just basically been a bully, you know, style defensive lineman, and that's not going to work in the NFL. I watched him versus Maryland and Iowa, Maryland was not a great game for him. Iowa was. You can see he's very good. He can play the run. Like maybe that's, that's what that's maybe good, that's yeah. what appealed. But they really need to develop him as a pass rusher. He's he rushes too upright, and but he's long and lanky, and and it shows on tape. So he's kind of like a blank canvas to me. I think they view him as like a guy 
Kind of like Sweat was last year, right? Yeah. Right. I think those. if one of the two of those guys works out, maybe you have a long-term partner for Derek Barnett. But, yeah, to talk about depth, I do think it might be curtains for Chris Long. Yeah, um, I mean, he's pretty much said that much. He yeah. told the Eagles to plan for life without him. Yeah, I mean, I like... So, here, you look at it. The problem is, is they don't have a guy who can be like a 12-sack guy. I mean, they didn't after they traded yeah, Michael Bennett I mean, that's anyway. Not, that's not really Barnett or Brandon Graham's game. Right. They they put a focus on rushing from the interior, bringing back Timmy Jernigan. Which maybe, and, maybe like Malik Jackson is that guy. Yeah, Malik Jackson. He had, might be their 10-sack guy. This year. I mean, Fletcher Cox, too. Yeah, Fletcher Cox. and it, I could see them combining. And by the way, they 20. brought back Timmy Jernigan, too. Yeah. I think I think if Fletcher Cox and Malik Jackson can combine for like eighteen to twenty sacks, the, then I think that's feel a good. legitimate possibility. Honestly, yeah, I mean, uh, I covered Jackson's Malik. never he, he's never. I mean, he played next to Calais Campbell, but yeah. Fletcher Cox is a different beast. Yeah, um, and they moved Calais all around. Yeah. Fletcher's pretty like stationary. He's, he's pretty rare. He's going to be double teamed. Right. Yeah, he should eat from this. Yeah. There's a. He, it would be disappointing if he didn't. I used to talk about. Uh, Fletcher Cox with Malik Jackson when he was in Jacksonville and he always admired his game. So I, I'm pretty sure he's stoked about this opportunity. Yeah. Um, yeah, from a defensive end standpoint, while we're on the subject, Derek Barnett coming off shoulder surgery, you don't know if he's going to lose any of his juice, but he played extremely well those first few Before weeks. getting hurt, yeah. The Eagles yeah. love, they're pretty confident. In yeah. They I, need I, him to live up to it. Like, I, that's, there's I, no, there's pressure on him. I think, I think he'll be fine. Um, you know, Brandon Graham's going to see a drop off in play. He's 31, yeah. His yeah. athleticism already is starting to come down a little right. bit. Right. Vinny Curry's here as just a veteran Rotational who knows this. Guy, yeah. yeah. He's, he's probably, healthy, he's a good third defensive end. Yeah. Right. He's just not going to get you a lot of sacks. But, if, but also, if any of those top three guys get hurt, they're in trouble. Right. Because you have, I mean, realistically behind them, you have Sharif Miller, Josh Sweat, Sweat and Deshaun Hall, and Joe, Joe Osman. Osman. Yeah. Who they love. <laughs> I could see them bringing in another defensive end. The thing is, too, is if, depending on the sets that they run, Malik Jackson can play some defensive ends. Push him outside, bring in Jernigan. Yeah. Uh, you know, Trayvon Hester maybe can play some defensive end, but like you. Ideally you, not. Yeah. You you probably don't want that. We're, we're, they're more deep at defensive tackle now than defensive end. They're already. very deep at defensive tackle, yeah. in my they have opinion. Four guys that you could be happy with. And then Bruce Hector is like the fifth. Or actually, no, no, five. No, I mean, they have the guy they traded for. Ridgeway. Yeah, Hassan Ridgeway, who I if, think... If will, he's healthy, yeah. Yeah, he and Trayvon Hester are going <laughs> to compete for that fourth role, and then the other guy will be inactive on game days, maybe. But um, I also think he's insurance for Tim Jernigan if he is not healthy enough to... Because I caught that how he said, hopefully it's a healthy year for Timmy Jernigan. That kind of was interesting to me to outright I mean, he only that. played like 50 snaps all of last year or something. Right. I mean, he played well in the playoffs, yeah. I thought. Um, I th- when he's healthy, I mean, they gave him a huge contract because they really like him, and then they, then he lost it because of his back. Like, Well, now he can rehab his value. It's yeah. kind of like Vinny and Curry. I, I, I've been saying all offseason they should, they probably are going to bring him back, and that, it took a little longer than I thought, and it was they were messing with us by bringing him on the day of the draft to kind of tip to what they were doing, it almost yeah. seemed like. If Chris Long retires, I could see them trading for like kind of a a, a DN with ex- like a somebody like, a, like low, a Hassan low cost guy, yeah, a Hassan Ridgeway yeah. for the defensive end. There are guys out there, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know they've signed a bunch of undrafted free agents, so they're going to have to cut some people anyway. So maybe this roster. I mean, they said they're not done. So. I mean, guys get cut too. There'll be guys yeah. that'll get cut for money. Um, yep. All right, let's Last. go to your favorite guy. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> This this one got the most mixed reaction out of any of their picks, and I think for good reason. He's a pretty mercurial quarterback option. He um so he broke out in twenty sixteen in Northwestern and that kind of put him on the map for the NFL. He's a six foot four, six foot five type quarterback, which if you want to find out what, if you want to find out what kind of quarterback the Eagles are looking in the draft, just go to the height height measurements. That that's why I, I was hesitant when you, you were in love with Gardner Minshew. I didn't think they were ever gonna draft a guy that was only six feet tall. Um he had a great 2016. He was the winningest player in Northwestern history. He got them the four straight bowl games. I don't know if the last two years how much of that had to do with him exactly. Uh, he had, I think, tw- what was, I forget what the number was, like 27 interceptions combined the last two years and only like 31 touchdowns. That's not really like typically a draftable quarterback, like numbers-wise, like not even looking at the film. You don't find many quarterbacks who have those numbers and get drafted. I know... He he did tear his ACL at the end of his junior year, and I'm sure that impacted him as a senior. Um, he didn't have really good options to throw to. Like his his uh, options in the past game were pretty bad. Mm-hmm. Having said all of that, I'm not sure this was the guy to go with. They clearly they're really passionate about him. Like Doug Peterson got pretty fired up. 
They really like that he like they said the things that they liked are that he's a winner, that he has arm strength, and that he can make like make plays with his legs. Like it didn't focus on they didn't focus on his accuracy. They didn't focus on his struggles last two years. They focused on the only three things you can point to and be like, okay, all right. So now give me your <laughs> give us what you got. Okay, how many games of his did you watch? I watched three games. I watched him this full disclosure. I did not watch him in 2016. Uh, so I watched him versus Purdue, Duke, and Notre Dame. A lot of Notre Dame. I saw a lot of Notre Dame. Well, because they got a lot week. of Big Ten guys and yeah. guys that play Notre Dame usually. So let me. Uh, let me give you something. So Clayton Thorson is six foot four, two twenty two. Doug Peterson six foot three, two twenty two. <laughs> um, Do you see, does he see himself? Is this where you're going? I think so. Uh, so to say that Clayton, I want to choose my words wisely. To say that Clayton Thorson has an accuracy issue would be a compliment. <laughs> Uh, these throws were all over the place in these games. And maybe, I I mean, I'm going to do more research and watch more games, but uh, the ball was constantly behind receivers. Receivers had to, to make plays on the ball as opposed to the ball going to them. When he's accurate, the dude looks like a first-round quarterback. The problem is it's too... Like, he'll throw... Far between that. He'll throw to a crossing pattern, and the ball will be, like, on the dude's hip. Like, you can't do that in the NFL. Um, I definitely see where the interceptions come from. He takes a lot of unnecessary risks with the ball. And it's either he trusts his wide receivers too much, or he trusts his arm too much. He can make every throw. He, it's just a matter of where the ball placement is. He's got a legitimate ball placement issue. From the games that I watched, I love his pocket presence. He's constantly on his toes, moves around very, very well. He takes some unnecessary sacks, but he can move around very well in the pocket. Um, the knee injury did not, at least from what I saw, did not. Yeah, his mobility's there. I totally get where they're coming from. So they, uh, like, they like his tools, clearly, is the big yeah, thing, Yeah, right? he's yeah. a he's a tool prospect. That's what he is. Like, they, they didn't draft him because he's got, like, tremendous upside. He's just... I think it's a lot like Sharif Miller. If you if you're able to if you feel comfortable in your coaching staff that they Which, can develop with quarterbacks, back. they obviously do. Yeah, yeah Press Taylor, Doug Peterson. Um, I think this is a good long term project for Peterson. I think Peterson needed that. I mean, he's already got Carson. You know how much he loves Carson, but like this is a guy he can craft behind the scenes, kind of play for. He can mold himself as opposed to someone coming in pre made. Right. He he can be Doctor Frankenstein a little bit. Nate and, Sudfeld's and, probably gone next like year. Like instead of buying a pre made salad at Trader Joe's, he's making his own salad out. Right. Correct. <laughs> you create your own is always better because then you can choose between feta or cheddar. Uh, but like, yeah, the accuracy is is a problem, like a genuine problem. Um, I think he he's tough as nails. I mean, he took some hits in these games. His offensive line was not very good. His wide receivers were not very good. But some of the decisions he made in, in these games, uh, there was an interception he had where he threw late, didn't like, didn't acknowledge that safeties play the game of football, and just like targeted downfield in triple cover. It was like the weirdest throw and decision I've ever made. I, I didn't see it in all 22, so I don't know what he saw, but it was just a very poor decision. He did make an amazing throw. I want I want to acknowledge this. I think it, it was the Notre Dame game. So there was a a slot receiver who who ran a nine route from the slot. Just ran straight. Um and he hit him like over the shoulder in a tight window, and I could, I could see someone getting excited about him from that because it seems like he flashes that. I don't think he's ever going to be a starter in the NFL. I don't think this is a guy that they're going to flip for a second round pick in a few years. But if he could be a long term like Jim Sorgi like backup for Carson Wentz, who's cheap, I think this is really smart. He seems to have a really good intangibles, really good leadership ability. And, you know, if Carson is stays healthy, they have really nothing to worry about because he's going to do his job. He's going to be comfortable as a backup. And really, that's what he should be. Like, Mike Kafka's career was ruined because Jeremy Macklin dropped a pass against Atlanta several years ago. Um, and he was the last good Northwestern quarterback to come to the NFL. 
I think this guy can have a similar career, but can have longevity based because of the coaching staff that he has. And now Mike Kafka's an, an offensive say, coordinator. So, you're, so what you're saying is in 10 years from now, he's going to be like Doug Peterson's assistant. <laughs> Probably. Probably. <laughs> I, I he's, think, a smart, he's a smart guy. I think so. Doug Peterson sees a lot in him, uh, of, of, of him, him, and in, him. In, in him. And and there's nothing wrong with that. I th- And Doug Peterson was a pretty good backup for I'm sure years. Doug Peterson pushed for them to get a guy like this, honestly. Because if it's a quarterback, Doug's involved. Well, and you know, we t- when we do when we do our grades at nj.com, we we talk about need value or need talent and value. The talent open ended. The value, okay, fine. I mean, it's a quarterback. Need when Jeffrey Lurie, the owner says, "We'd like to add a quarterback every year." That's a you're gonna draft a quarterback almost every year. Yeah. So that's like a that's a mission statement. And I think of the guys remaining, I know a lot of people like Tyree Jackson, but supposedly his mechanics are everywhere. I've only watched one game of his, so I can't really. I mean, the tools their tools are tantalizing with him too. But he was an undrafted free agent, so obviously his right. tools aren't that impressive. I and, guess. and former Eagle Scout and, and uh, NFL draft analyst Jer- Daniel Jeremiah compared him to Logan Thomas and said. You know, sometimes comparisons can really be good, and sometimes they can really hurt you. And because Logan Thomas didn't work out, pe- teams are a little afraid. Ironically, uh, <laughs> he signed with the Bills, who had Logan Thomas as a tight end tight for end, a little, yeah. little <laughs> while. Um, it, whatever. I mean, he's basically the team. If seven. you're getting a quarterback in the fifth to seventh round, they're all kind of the same. So. He, Let's talk. You talked about the trade value with Andre Dillard. We should also consider the trade value with Clayton Thorson, right? So they traded back four spots with the Patriots and picked up a seventh round pick, which in turn turned into Hassan Ridgeway. Tackle has been in the league, yeah. Right. So you got a third yeah, string you have to, you quarterback have to that into the and, equation and a rotational defensive tackle with experience for a fifth round pick. I think people were knocking that. I I, I gave Clayton Thorson by himself a C. Um. Because there were guys on the board that I thought could help the Eagles immediately. They do clearly have a safety depth need, in my opinion. It's definitely a need. Sorry, Twitter. Um, they also had guard needs. But, again, I, I, I think I get the logic behind this pick, and I understand what they saw, I think. Um, but, you know, he's a, I guess we'll see, sort of thing. I mean, you talk about his breakout year in 2016. It was a breakout year, I guess. But he only completed 58.6% of his passes. He only threw for 22 touchdowns, and he still threw nine interceptions. Turnovers and accuracy issues kill quarterbacks. And if he can't develop quickly, he's going to be another Tanner Lee. I mean, really, that's, you know. Yeah. All right, so we'll touch on their undrafted free agent so quick and then wanted to go through one more thing with you. But So they the, the big, we won't go through every name, but the big ones they signed were Wisconsin linebacker T.J. Edwards, mm-hmm. uh, Penn State offensive lineman Ryan Bates, Stanford offensive lineman. What was that guy's name? I just blanked out his name. I don't know. Chris. It was Chris on that. Look that up while we're talking. Um, oh, I have it right here. Sorry. Yeah. What was the guy's name? Uh, give me a second. I thought you said you had it right here. No, I had I had the page open. Wait, sorry. Excuse me. Uh, they signed Nate Herbig. Nate Herbig. Yeah. Uh, Some people had projected as a draft pick. Uh, um, they also signed Sanford linebacker Joey yeah, Alfieri. Joey Alfieri. He's pretty athletic. The big name is T.J. Edwards, and I, oh, I also want to, if I can pronounce his name right, the guy from Isua Opeta uh, from Weber State. He's gotten rave reviews. He was and at they, the they gave him a decent uh, contract for undrafted mm-hmm. guy. So I wanted to have, like just real quick. So somebody made a great point to me because everybody got all excited about T.J. Edwards, and fans were pretty mad that the Eagles didn't draft a linebacker. So things, something that people need to think about is perspective when it comes to, like, an expectation when it comes to the NFL draft. Because if I if I had told fans that the Eagles drafted T.J. Edwards in the fifth round and they signed Clayton Thorson as a free agent, they wouldn't be acting they wouldn't be acting as mad as they were. It, it's it's all about perception of draft value. Like mm-hmm. it, just because everybody online is telling you a certain guy should be drafted in first in a certain round, uh, that doesn't mean that's the case. And, you know, Chauncey Gardner Johnson was a popular target for Eagles fans. He dropped all the way to the fourth round, like. So if if you look at how a team, everybody in the NFL values these guys, you have to factor that in the equation because if, if, if it's all just perception. Like if, if T.J. Edwards was their draft pick and Clayton Thorson was an undrafted guy, then everybody would be ecstatic right now. I, I find that I find that very interesting point that somebody made to me. I, I've said this before on the podcast. I'm a big believer. If you can get three starters out of a draft class or three 
main contributors out of a draft class, you should feel good about your draft class. I think they're going to have at least three contributors there. Yeah, when you go talk about day four picks, I don't care about day four picks as, as much as... Day four picks? Or sorry, day... <laughs> I was like, there's a fourth day now? Oh, I couldn't, give me a break. I, I uh, couldn't handle a fourth day. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, sorry, day three picks. I was just reading something, and it said four. I was like, is he trying to say undrafted yeah. free agents? Like, that's yeah, a clever so, way of saying that? Yeah, I think I, I just read fourth round, and so I was thinking day four. Um, I don't care so much about day three picks, like, where they're slotted. I know we just spent, like, yeah. five minutes talking about Thorson and, and Sharif Miller, but... You know, there are, like you said, there is a runoff, and undrafted guys can be pretty productive. Look at Corey Clement. So I think that there's some Corey Clement factors in here. There's always an undrafted guy that, that kind of shines. Last year's Bruce Hector. I mean, he didn't shine all that well, but he well, shot. And, and there's also and always, a, and there's always a guy that the fans get, you know, irrationally attached to. It'll be Edwards this year. It was Adams last year. Patrick Turner is like the famous one. Yeah, Patrick Turner was a good one. People really I mean, like Corey Clement was a big. I mean, like, it helps when they're local guys. T.J. Edwards isn't a local guy. People loved Russell Shepard back in the day. Um, it, but my my point being, like, you can number one, you can find value with undraft free agents, but also take a step back and consider, like, your how you value guys is not the same way these teams do. Clearly, they didn't value any of these safeties in this class enough to go and get one, and the, and it didn't seem like the NFL teams did either because. There was very few safeties drafted early. Two guys that I want to bring up, along with Edwards, who have pretty decent shot. Delvon uh, Randall was at his pro day at Temple. Dude's a big safety. Maybe he can hit a little. If there's an injury, maybe he makes a roster. I think Ryan Bates is making this roster, like, probably soundly. Like, he's he's going to make this roster. Unless they sign, like, a veteran or something. Right. He's a guy who can play offensive tackle guard and a little bit of center. Uh, another Penn State guy. Man, the Eagles made the most of their trip to Penn State. <laughs> yeah, they got that receiver, too. Yeah, uh, who, Tompkins. by the Yeah, DeAndre Tompkins, who Micro spent, like, 20 minutes talking to after the pro day. Um, but, yeah, Ryan Bates, to me, is a guy who has the versatility to get the job done. I think you know, you look at their guard depth, it's really Matt Breyer. Even if he's a guy that's on their practice squad and they call him up, kind of like right. a protector type of thing. I mean, I think a lot of, if it plays out, can they get something for Big V maybe now that he's expendable? The more, the more I've thought about it, I th- I, the more I think they do move on for Big V because, you don't number one, you don't draft a guy in the first round unless you think he can play right away. And if you think Dillard can play right away, you're not playing a Vitae over him. Right. And then my lot is like the project that you keep on your roster so nobody else steals him from you. Right. So there you go. There's your two tackles. And then you have Bates, who has a resume where he played offensive tackle and offensive guard and prior. I mean, look, they could bring back Chance Warmack, but like, I'm very concerned about their guard depth. Like, yeah, Matt Pryor's never issue. played in, a, in an actual game. I mean, the fact that you're getting all excited about an undrafted guy being their main backup isn't a great sign either. Right. Well, <laughs> like, and there's they, a reason why he was undrafted. Well, they also don't really have a backup center like at you all. Could, you I can mean, let's say Amalo is, I guess. Right, but then you're weakening guard, yeah. which they don't have any depth. And also, oh, what if Sam Amalo's the guy? Getting, that there's a guy who was fighting with me on Twitter because I said Wisniewski is gone, and he's like, "How do you know he's gone? Huh? Seven Wisniewski's not coming back. <laughs> yeah, he's gone. <laughs> but um, they need a guy. They need someone to replace him, though. Like as much sure. as he fell off last year. Um, all right. So before we go, I wanted to play a little game with you. Um, as always, <laughs> I love throwing games at you, and you don't expect it. Yeah, I'm gonna call it "If I Had Told You." So if you, if, if I, had if I had told you, okay. So you have to pretend like you don't know what happened in the draft, where guys are drafted, and I'm gonna say, we're gonna, I'm gonna tell you if, if I had told you the Eagles had drafted Andre Dillard at 22, or if I had told you they had drafted X player at 25. Like, what should you have rather to go into the draft? Like, if I had told you this before the draft, do you understand what I'm saying? Sure, whatever. <laughs> yeah, we'll try. It. Yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, you're giving me a scenario. Yes. Okay. So, because there, there's certain guys they pass on, I found it interesting, and I just, I'm, like, if you think about who they, if they ended up with all the per, best case scenario guys, how much differently we'd be looking at their draft. Cool. So, if I told you before the draft the Eagles got Andre Dillard at 22, or if I had told you that they got Montez set at 25, which would you have been happier with? Dillard. Dillard, yeah. That one's, we talked about if Sweat's there going to run to the podium to get him, but we didn't know Dillard mm-hmm. would be there. I thought Dillard was going to be a top Second round Sanders, there's there's only like three picks in between their picks. So oh, like, man, you just <laughs> created a nickname and you didn't even know it. What? Second round Sanders. Second. <laughs> so the only guys that were picked between Sanders and Arcega Whiteside were Lonnie Johnson, Max Sharping, and Mikal Hardman, and they weren't picking any of those guys over Miles yeah. Sanders. But, all right, so if I told you the Eagles were picking J.J. Arcega Whiteside at 57 or one of Nazir Adderley, Juan Thornhill, or D.K. Metcalf. 
probably would have gone with one of those three, right? Before the draft. You looked up at... Uh, I'd say Juan Thornhill yeah. would be the guy. I was surprised he fell off. I thought he was going to be a late, late, late first, yeah. early second. DK's drop. I mean, clearly there's something there. I don't know. Well, I mean, he ran like two routes in college, yeah. and he had a lot of injuries. All right, if I told you you could have Golden Tate or Jalen Ferguson... Or or, Kalen San, or Colin Sanders. I'd pro- uh, <laughs> Golden, I Golden mean, State I'm not in love with any of those Golden guys. State for eight games or uh, defensive line depth. No, uh, I don't love any of those guys. <laughs> but um, well, this is just the area of the guys that were there. Sanders. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So the Golden Tate trade, thumbs down. <laughs> or Chauncey Gardner Johnson. Chauncey Gardner yeah. Johnson. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot about him. All right, fourth round. They got Sharif Miller, 138. If I told you they had picked. Deontay Thompson or Ben Burke or Sharif Miller? Which one would you have preferred? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Sharif Miller, Deontay Thompson, or Ben Burke the linebacker from Washington? Uh, I, Sharif Miller, you always value Interesting. Ed Rusher. Or Mac Wilson, but it sounds like he had some issues. <laughs> yeah. And then Clayton Thorson, <laughs> whoever I say next is probably going to say that guy. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Uh, let's see. We got David Edwards. Your David boy. Edwards. Not even close. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I don't even need to go on. But there's like Gardner Minshew, Lamont Gallier, the center. Um, Isaiah Bugs, defensive tackle. Like that. Isaiah Bugs. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that was all their picks. But I, I don't know. I, just thought, I, just, I always find it interesting the guys that teams pass on. And like if you just can, if you had said you would draft a certain guy before the draft. Because like I said, it's all about perception. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um... You know, it's also interesting to watch what happens out of trades, right? Like, yeah, um, yeah. Like let's, the who, Ravens, let's see I think, who's got, picked with their fourth rounder, they traded Iman Marshall, the cornerback. Yeah, uh, who's pretty good. But like Tony Pollard was picked after that. Jarrett Stidham was picked after that. I know the, you would, you preferred Stidham over uh, Thorson. Michael Jordan, I like him as like a center guard guy. Well, the Patriots traded up to get a punter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like and the Four Niners after like a twenty-seven year old punter. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Life comes at you fast. Is he Australian? Probably. Usually they are. <laughs> yeah. He's Australian or a Mormon. Yeah. That happens. Um, You're the punter guy. <laughs> it's true. I am the punter guy. That's what they actually call me in the street. My kid almost called me punter guy, but then it came out <laughs> the other day. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting. Um, one note I want to make, they've signed a lot of undrafted guards, and I think agents are very smart with, with how they've really... Like, when... when the process is, and I've talked to a lot of agents about this, when the draft's over and you get these offers, you immediately scour depth. Well, you've done it in advance, but you scour depth charts to see what who who's done what during the offseason, how many so-and-sos are at a certain position. And clearly, agents see, wow, there are a, there's a lot of opportunity for guards. I think two undrafted guards can make the team, uh, at least. Um... So, you know, kudos to them. It seems like every year the the Eagles sign like two or three guys that had like really good college careers. One drops off immediately. So it'll be interesting to see who they like because he just doesn't have it. Yeah. Um, Somebody in this group. Maybe it's CJ Edwards. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't get too overhyped. That's but, the thing. Like if a guy's undrafted, there's a reason why he's undrafted. Like we can say we like this guy, this guy, this guy, but 32 teams could have drafted any of these guys and nobody did. So For sure. And and I think, you know, there's going to be some good competition. I still, I still doubt their depth at safety. Having four guys that can play the position that you know can play the position – uh, and a few other guys that don't have very high upside, that's not strong or good safety depth. That's okay safety depth. And for a team that constantly wants to get better at positions, I'm concerned about them long-term at free safety. I'm concerned about them long-term at third uh, with the third safety, big nickel. Uh, if you want to move Avante Maddox to the slot full-time, then you don't even need to run that package because he can play safety. He's a safety corner hybrid now because um, they'll probably ask him to gain a few pounds. But, like... I don't know, with Jalen Mills and Ronald Darby both coming off season ending injuries that look like they needed time to recover in the off season. I'm not sure how I feel about moving uh Avante Maddox to safety when he was so good at corner. The same could be said about slot receiver. I mean, everybody's dying to trade out Nelson Aguilar for value. But who are you but replacing him with? Yeah. Who's gonna play in the slot other than him? Like that's a concern of mine too. Shelton Gibson can't play there. I mean, I really like Doran Miller a lot. Uh, I'm wondering if he could be a dark horse, but 
You know, he was a one trick pony during Charles Johnson played the slot at all. I don't really know what his, his uh, he's is. played all three. If I remember correctly, so I think but... he's an interesting guy that could steal Shelton Gibson's roster spot, honestly. Yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I think they keep six and I think the first five, uh, five, first five are pretty set unless Matt yeah. Collins gets hurt again. Yeah. I think the first five would be Alshon, Deshaun, Nelson, JJ, JJ. and Jack. And Mac. Yeah. Um, and then I think a six guy's competing for a role. Sheldon Gibson's a really good gunner. That's what he's got going for him. And but, he's fast. Yeah, but, uh, you know, he's realistically caught, I think, four passes in two years. So it, I think that six spots can be wide open. There's a couple of CFL guys who are kind of interesting. Um, and then you've got the ultimate wild card in Braxton Miller. Whatever. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I think they still have spots that they could really kind of fine-tune uh if i was an undrafted free agent wide receiver i wouldn't sign here if i was an undrafted corner i wouldn't sign here if i was an undrafted um you know running back running back i probably wouldn't wouldn't sign here if i was a tight end i wouldn't even acknowledge philadelphia calling me although i mean you could go in the practice squad and replace richard rogers next year or something sure but uh, I, I think they like Josh Perkins, too, who's going to be back after injury. I rule him out come making the team on That's actually going to be an interesting third safety battle between Perkins and Rodgers. You mean um, third tight end? Third end, yeah. <laughs> you have oh safety on the Oh, my God, man. I mean, I, they also, brain, they also view sorry, guys. Perkins, Perkins is like a hybrid receiver, too. So he's like maybe in a fourth guy if they kept it. Yeah, but. so, yeah, I mean, you, you run a lot of two, two tight end sets, so you could probably keep four. 13 personnel, baby. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, hey, go for it. Um, <laughs> All right, let, let's, let's uh, wrap up on that note. Um, I will say a, a date to keep in mind is May 7th, which is about two weeks from now. That's the last day where signings will count against the compensatory formula. I think you'll see the Eagles sign somebody after that point, whether that's a defensive end, a safety. I, I think keep a lookout for a trade. Uh, or, the, yeah, I trade's think, possible, too. I, I think there are guys on the market that are interesting. Yeah, and this go, is... Go and get Chris Harris to do th- it. This is typically where Howie kind of proves that he is magic. playing on another level than everybody else. And... Frankly, with the amount of draft picks they're going to have next year, I think he's probably willing to to kind of put the cart before the horse, if that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Before we go, I just want to remind you guys that I was right. The Eagles did not draft a cornerback in the first round. So you can all shut up. Also, <laughs> by the way, called them trading with the Ravens and the Patriots during draft weekend. They did both. You're welcome, America. <laughs> But just ignore all the other stuff oh, we got also, wrong. Also, I thought they weren't going to draft a quarterback or a running back, Zach. <laughs> Boom. Money. Touche. Yeah, I was going to say, except for all the stuff we did get wrong. There were yeah. a couple things we got right. Listen, why would we acknowledge that <laughs> <Yeah>. ever? <laughs> all right, we'll end on that note. Uh, if you guys want to speak to us about your emotions after watching Game of Thrones or Avengers Endgame, tweet at us at Zach Blatt. At we're Mike here for it. Underscore E underscore K. That's all we want you to tweet us about at this point, to be honest. Yeah. Um, leave a comment, write a review, subscribe. And thanks for listening, guys. Bye.